So I've just achieved something that only 0.02% of people do, and that is hit 100% average sleep over the last month. Waking up completely rested every day has been a game changer for me. I'm more productive, my mood is better, and I've had so much more energy for my workouts and just life in general. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you should aim for 100% sleep every night. I just want to share with you a typical day in my life, which enables me to sleep consistently well. And with the average person missing out on somewhere between 30 minutes and two hours sleep every single night, hopefully some of the tips will be helpful to you. Oh, and before you say there is no way I can get 100% sleep, I've got small children, I got one of those too. So let's start with some bedroom basics where I've tried to make our sleep environment as close to perfectly dark as is reasonably possible. And I've done that by addressing light from the outside of the house, light from inside of the house and also light from in the room itself. Now there are plenty of ways to black out a window but I find the combination of blackout blinds and blackout curtains is better than just using one or the other. But of course the other simple way to achieve complete blackout is by wearing an eye mask to sleep in. But I also had light coming in from the inside of my house. For some reason they put a window above the bedroom door. So if anyone turns on the light outside or in the middle of summer, we get light coming into the bedroom. Now ideally I'd like to replace that glass with something opaque, but until I get around to doing that, I've actually just used blackout film on this window here. The blind is really just for show. So that's the light getting into the room sorted, but I'm still left with this annoyingly bright light from this Sonos, which is the status light. Similarly, the status light on this baby monitor is strangely bright considering it's designed to go in a bedroom. Luckily, there's a very simple solution to this. These LED light stickers work really well at cutting down the light significantly without completely blocking it out, which means the light won't disturb you, but you can still see the status of the device, which for me, I really wanna know that that baby monitor is actually switched on before I go to sleep. And this would also work really well for a digital alarm clock. I'll put a link to those stickers and any other products I mentioned in the description below this video. Next, we tend to keep our bedroom on the cooler side and I'll let this room drop to about 16 degrees or 61 Fahrenheit in the cooler months and just use thicker bedding. There's a decent body of evidence to say that we sleep better in cooler rooms and that ties in nicely with the fact that our bodies cool down as we go to sleep. I'll put the commonly quoted target figures for bedroom temperature on the screen for you. In summer, and despite this being the UK, due to the weird construction of our house, we have a problem with the room overheating. So we had aircon installed, which we set to about 21 degrees, and I find that temperature with thinner bedding means that I can sleep perfectly well on warmer summer nights. And year round, we'll have the window on the latch to let some fresh air in, but also locked for safety. Now this does allow a bit of noise in, and at 4.30 this morning, I was woken up by an owl. But generally, it's pretty quiet where we live. We don't have a lot of traffic, not a lot of sirens at night. My wife doesn't snore, so I don't use earplugs or white noise generators or anything like that. Now I can totally see the argument for wearing earplugs and I do sometimes use them when I'm traveling, but at home I wanna be able to hear things like the baby monitor and despite my quest for sleep, I actually do still wanna be woken up in case of emergency or if something unexpected happens during the night. Let's talk about the bed itself. Now you can get some really fancy mattresses that cost many thousands. There are some very high tech ones around that do stuff like change temperature dependent on your sleep phase. I don't have one of those, but I do love a gadget. So if you happen to be watching from the company that makes those and you wanna send me one for review on this channel, well, you know how to get in touch. So whilst you don't need to spend thousands on a mattress to give you perfect sleep, I do think it's worth spending some extra money here. Now I'm not gonna sit here and tell you how much you should spend on a mattress, but I would say consider that a good quality mattress may well last you 10 years and you might spend in excess of eight hours a night on that. It might be an area where you might like to spend a little bit more money if you can. 
I think a lot of people are confused about how firm a mattress they should get. Again, there's a pretty high-tech solution to this. We went to a mattress shop who did a free assessment on us. Basically, you just lay on a bed with a load of sensors for a few minutes and it tells you whether you should get a firm, medium or soft mattress. Okay, that's the sleep environment stuff done. And I know some of you will be thinking a lot of that seems quite obvious and you'd be right. But in my experience of helping people with their sleep, it's often one or two areas of these basics that are overlooked that can make a big difference. And then there's one really big area which had the biggest impact on my sleep, which I'll be sharing with you later on. But first, I wanna talk about exercise. Typically, I will exercise in the morning, and that's for several reasons. Firstly, because my motivation to exercise in the evenings is really low. It's something that I like to get out of the way first thing in the morning, so I don't have to think about it for the rest of the day. But exercising in the evening can interrupt your sleep pattern for two reasons. Exercise increases body temperature. Remember our bodies like to cool off as we head towards sleep and vigorous exercise does the exact opposite. And vigorous exercise also causes your cortisol levels to rise. That's your stress hormone, not ideal before bed. It is possible to exercise in the evening without it impacting your sleep, but make sure you keep it gentle and leave plenty of time between finishing and actually going to sleep. Now let's talk about one of my favorite subjects, Caffeine. I love coffee, and since I gave up alcohol, it feels like caffeine is my final vice. Now, there's a lot of generic advice around caffeine intake and sleep, such as make sure you stop drinking caffeine after noon. But the truth is, everyone responds differently to caffeine. And I know because I've experimented that I can drink a cup of tea at about 4 p.m. and still get to sleep without issue and have no negative effect on my sleep quality when I do get to sleep. So what about naps during the day? Well, I don't tend to nap during the day. It's not that I've got anything against naps. I just personally find that I don't need one, nor does it fit into my schedule particularly well. I'll talk about the time I get up and go to sleep a bit later on. I think if I ever needed to change either or both of those, I might consider adding in a nap. Similarly, if my daughter had been unwell and had been up a significant part of the night, I definitely consider a nap at that point, but this would be the exception rather than the rule. Okay, heading into the evening time now. I try to avoid working in the evening. I'm normally finished by five, which gives my brain a chance to calm down. On occasions, it's a bit later, but rarely past 7 p.m. Now, I've done plenty of shift work in my career to date, but these days I'm lucky enough that I have a degree of control over that, so I don't do late shifts or night shifts anymore. Now, I know not everybody is able to do that, and so if you work in the emergency services or in healthcare or anything where you keep other people safe, then I'd like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to you for doing what you do. But me, I'm generally home by about 5 p.m. at the latest and we'll eat as a family shortly after that. Now, of course, there are many reasons why eating late is bad for you, but I've already talked about the need for our bodies to cool down in order to get to sleep. And digestion of food is one of those processes within our bodies that generates a lot of heat. So ideally, we want to leave a decent gap between eating and going to bed. I try to consume a decent amount of water at this time too too late into the evening and I'm gonna be up peeing in the night. This way it gives my kidneys a chance to do their thing before I go to sleep. Talking of increasing body temperatures, preventing us from getting to sleep, let's talk about bath time. Now there isn't anything wrong with having a bath in the evening as long as you avoid the classic bath time mistake, which is getting straight out of the bath, quickly drying off and then getting wrapped up or warm. Remember, you need to cool down in order to get off to sleep. So when you get out of the bath, your blood vessels are all dilated, ready to give off heat. So give yourself a bit of naked time in order to let your body cool down. Now, I mentioned earlier that I don't drink, but I just wanted to talk about alcohol very briefly. Whilst alcohol may make you feel sleepy, the positive effects pretty much end there. Now, I can make an entire video about why alcohol disrupts sleep, but essentially it disrupts everything about your normal pattern of sleeping. So when you do fall asleep, you're likely getting significantly reduced restorative sleep, even after just a small amount. So as I'm making this video, it's currently October and today it's getting dark before 5 p.m. So let's talk about lighting. For a number of years, I've been a fan of Philips Hue bulbs. Not really the fancy colored ones, just the ones with the ability to switch between cool lighting for morning times and the warmer end of the spectrum, which we tend to use in the evening time. 
I especially love that you can set up automations to change your lighting at specific times of the day, including in response to sunrise and sunset. My favorite automation is the one that changes our lights from bright to dim over about 30 minutes from 6.30 every evening. This is essentially a simulated sunset that's primarily aimed at getting my daughter ready for bed, but it leaves us with a nice, dim, warm light after 7 p.m. And the same automation also turns off all of the lights that are ceiling mounted. The reason for this is because the receptors in our eyes that are most sensitive to light are in the bottom of our eyes because that way they respond to the sun. So by keeping the overhead lights off, you're not getting too much light into that area of your eyes. So my daughter heads to bed at around 7 p.m hopefully, and the house is now pretty dark. And the thing that I like to try and avoid from this point onwards is screens. And I use an app called Opal that blocks all my social media accounts after 7 p.m. And that also includes WhatsApp. I love it because it takes away the temptation to sit on my phone scrolling of an evening. And this one is a biggie. I don't really watch TV either. I wouldn't even have a Netflix account if it wasn't for my wife. And on those rare occasions when I do end up having to do screen-based work into the evening, I try and remember to wear like blue like blocking glasses. What do you think? And there are a few other things that I like to do in order to help me wind down before sleep. Now, I've never really been into journaling, but I've recently started a very basic journaling practice in the evening since I read a book called The Gap and the Game. It takes literally just a couple of minutes. Firstly, I write down three things from the day that went well, and then I write down three important things that I'd like to get done the following day. And that's it. It might seem like a really insignificant practice, but I really like it because even on what seems like a bad day, there are always three positive things you can pull out of the day. And setting my intentions for the following day feels like a nice way of switching my brain off as the day comes to the end. Then when it's time to go to bed, I leave my phone on charge in our living room, and any Anyone who needs to contact me in an emergency overnight has got my landline number. And when I do go into my bedroom, the light switch again is Philips Hue. I've got that set so that on the first press of the button, the lights come on at a very low level. So I'm not suddenly blinded by a bright white light just before bed. Then when I'm in bed, I do use a Kindle to read with the brightness on the screen turned to a point where it's just bright enough to read. And yes, this is a blue light and no, I don't wear blue light blockers in bed. But as far as I can tell, this light isn't bright enough to cause me any issues getting to sleep. And I only ever read fiction in the evenings too. Never non-fiction. I want my brain to switch off, not fire up with new ideas. And I find being transported into somebody else's fictional world, it's like a sedative for me. And that's my day pretty much done and dusted, apart from one final thing. Everything I shared to this point is important, but what I'm about to share with you has had by far the biggest impact on me achieving a perfect night's sleep every night over the last month. The bad news is that for many people, this might be the most difficult habit to adopt. Every night I aim to be in bed by 8.30 p.m. and asleep by nine, which might seem ridiculously early to you, but the reason for this can really be explained by a couple of basic numbers relating to my sleep. Now, I've been using a whoop band for about six months to track my sleep, which has given me two really important pieces of data. Firstly, I need seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep per night. Secondly, I need to spend eight hours, 50 minutes in bed to achieve that. The difference between those two numbers is because we all spend a certain amount of time getting to sleep and awake during the night, even if we're not aware of it. And I actually think that the time needed in bed figure is the more practically useful of the two. So what time do I end up waking up? Well, for those of you who are quick at maths, you'll realize that I wake up sometime between about 5.30 and 6 a.m., which again is ridiculously early, but it will become clear in a minute why I get up at the crack of dawn. Now, I wake up without an alarm, and I don't like using an alarm clock to wake up for two reasons. Firstly, sometimes you get woken up in the middle of the wrong phase of sleep, such as in deep sleep, which just feels horrible, or you get woken up in the middle of a dream, which is just annoying. Secondly, the amount of sleep we need inevitably varies slightly on a night by night basis because after all, we're not machines. So I'd prefer to wake up when my body tells me it's ready. So why do I choose to get up so early when in reality I don't 
need to. I actually only need to get up by about 7 a.m. or 7.30 at the absolute latest in order to get to work. Well, firstly, it's because I like it. The early hours are extremely peaceful. My brain works best during these hours and during summer, it's the most beautiful part of the day. Secondly, I have a toddler, which can mean unpredictable nights. No, she's not one of those children who will sleep 12 hours straight through every night. But being in a sleep pattern when I usually wake up earlier than I need to means that I have a buffer. So if I've been awake in the night with her, then I've always got the option of going back to bed and sleeping a bit longer to make up for that. And this enables me to maintain 100% sleep on all but the very worst of nights. But of course, if you're not prone to be woken up in the night by a small child, then you wouldn't need to build in that buffer. So if getting to bed early is the biggest secret for getting perfect sleep, why did I say that for many, it's the most difficult habit to adopt? Well, because all of the stuff I talked about earlier in the video are pretty simple hacks. How dark our rooms are, how much caffeine we drink during the day, or when we exercise, are all pretty easy things to change. But getting to bed early is about what we're willing to sacrifice. For me, getting into bed at 8.30 means I have to forgo many of the things that I used to enjoy, such as sitting up binging Netflix whilst relaxing with a couple of glasses of red wine. For me, this is worth it because firstly, I love the feeling of having had a great night's sleep and how good that makes me feel during the day. And secondly, it helps me to avoid something that I absolutely hate. And that is going to do an 11 hour medical shift tired after having had a bad night's sleep because my daughter didn't sleep well. Tired doctors make bad decisions and I really hate going to work tired. But the real question is, how far do you wanna go in order to pursue consistently great sleep? And of course, this video has focused on improving the quantity of sleep, but what about the quality of our sleep? It's all very well getting enough sleep, but there is something very simple you can do of an evening to improve the quality of your sleep. I didn't cover it in this video, so make sure you check out the video that is on screen now, and then you'll have the complete package of sleeping quality and quantity.